20 years ago, we didn't have social media, so we had to find different ways of actually getting attention. Let's talk about one of those, the sperm bank. There was a report saying that the London Sperm Bank said that you couldn't donate sperm if you were dyslexic because you had a neurological deficit. Wow. I think the problem we have is the way that we measure intelligence. I proudly told my son's school that I thought he was dyslexic, and I was hit by a brick wall of, oh no, poor you. Oh dear, that's really sad. I I know that a lot of children are going to watch this episode and I know some of them are struggling that are not happy and were born with all their self-esteem and self-worth and they're not feeling that now. Imagine shifting perspectives so much that you add a new term to the dictionary. Well, that's Kate Griggs for you, a social entrepreneur and thought leader with two decades of experience in dyslexia. Through her charity Made by Dyslexia, Kate officially introduced dyslexic thinking to dictionary.com and even turned it into a recognized skill on LinkedIn. Her campaigns have sent shockwaves through the business world, prompting giants like Virgin and Microsoft to acknowledge dyslexic thinking as an indispensable skill. And if that's not impressive enough, she's also the author of two best-selling books on dyslexia. I love talking to Kate, her take on education, spelling, entrepreneurship, felt so inspired, and there were some tears. Let's get into it. Let's see how great minds think differently. Okay, hi, Kate. Thank Hello. you so much for coming on. My and I do, I do have to kind of, well, firstly, I was driving in this morning and thinking about my grandfather, and my grandfather was dyslexic, and... Having done kind of our research, I guess, on all the amazing work that you've done and actually growing up, my grandfather was teased a lot for not being, you know, not being inverted commas clever um, or be able to read properly or spell properly. But actually uh, listening to you and, and hearing about the strengths and hearing about the sort of flip on the narrative around dyslexia, I thought of a particular kind of instance because he was incredibly creative and he's a farmer and he decided to buy an airfield and it was a disused airfield and he bought the airfield for one single reason not because it could grow anything but because the tarmac if he pulled that up he could make more money from it than using it to grow crops and i just thought that was brilliant dyslexic thinking brilliant dyslexic thinking <laughs> So it, even that small thing, you know, re, reframes a lot of, I guess, how I, I loved my grandfather, but how I viewed the way his brain worked. And the impact that you've had is incredibly inspiring. But I, I wondered if you could just briefly kind of explain where we are now in 2024 versus where we were 25 years ago when you first started this whole kind of cause, crusade, journey, shift? I think in many ways we are way closer to a solution. I think well, as a charity we've aligned with the UN Sustainable Goals, so we have to achieve our mission by 2030, um, and that is to empower dyslexic thinking in every home, every school, every workplace. The irony is we've actually known, well, dyslexia was first identified in 1896. Wow. The first school that supported dyslexia was set up in 1936, which was Millfield School, using methodology that had been produced by Columbia University. So we've kind of known how to support the negatives at the challenges that we have with learning that long. And we've also known throughout history, all the brilliant people whose dyslexic thinking has created, you know, the iPhone or the airplane or Virgin or Ikea. Um, and that's been documented if you look throughout time as well. So it's actually quite crazy we're still here. I think the, the problem we have is the way that we measure intelligence and um, the way education measures intelligence and the workplace to a great degree. And the standardized tests that we use 
in both school and workplace completely lean into dyslexic challenges and they don't measure dyslexic thinking skills. I think the work that we've done as a charity, I founded Made by Dyslexia in 2017. We're seven years old this year. We've Congratulations. Got, thank you. We've got a real step change happening this year where we've managed to put together all of the research around dyslexic thinking skills, which I've worked on for a long time. Um, we got LinkedIn to recognize it as a skill. We've produced free training on LinkedIn for the workplace. We have free training on Microsoft for schools. We have our podcast, Lessons in Dyslexic Thinking, which is helping to, to teach the world what dyslexic thinking is. All of the resources are there. Now we need action. And that's what we're really pushing to change this year. And I think redefining how we see intelligence, uh, the fact all of the neurodiversity movement and things like this podcast, all of the work we're doing is going to shift the dial eventually. So I'm feeling more positive now about dyslexia and making sure everybody's empowered than I ever have. And um, what was it like 20, 25 years ago? I think it it was a lot worse then. Yeah. My education, um, I did really badly at school. I was then sent to a school that supported dyslexia. So I actually thought when I had my own children that everybody would know what dyslexia was, mm. that it came with this pattern of strengths and this is what you needed to do to support them. I proudly told my son's school that I thought he was dyslexic because he was really creative and fantastic at music. You know, he was just a smart cookie, mm. but he had no no interest in learning at all. And I was hit by a brick wall of, oh no, poor you. Oh dear, that's really sad. No, I don't think he's dyslexic. And this, the denial that he was mm. dyslexic because it's seen as a bad thing. And that hasn't gone completely now. It's okay. better. And I think what we can do now with social media is we can empower people to know all the positives and empower parents to actually say, if they hit that brick wall of teachers that aren't trained, which is, is very, very common, they now can push back. 20 years ago, we didn't have social media. So um, we had to find different ways of, of actually getting attention. And fortunately, communication and PR is one of the things that naturally dyslexics tend to be good at. So I kind of found a few smart ways to, yes. to get attention. <laughs> a few dyslexic thinking ways, yes. I, I would say. Let, <laughs> let's talk about one of those, the sperm bank. You know, I watched your TED talk and I was just like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Yeah, what a genius initiative. Could you just walk us viewers, listeners, just through that? So dyslexics are brilliant storytellers. We're very good at helping to, to use um, a, a narrative to make a point. And when we set up Made by Dyslexia, our brief to the ad agency was, you can be as disruptive as you want to because dyslexics love disruption. Um, but we want to get we want to be on the map instantly. So for an ad agency, that's just the most incredible brief. brief. They did everything for nothing for us, our first agency, which was phenomenal. Um, and there was a, a report, news report that had happened, come out about six months before we launched, um, saying that the London Sperm Bank um, said that you couldn't donate sperm if you were dyslexic because you had a neurological deficit. Wow. So there was a little bit of truth to it. And yeah. the best stories and the best campaigns always have that little bit of truth. It's sort of the enemy that you can pick on yeah. to drive something forward. So that's the agency's idea was, okay, well, let's let's set up a dyslexic sperm bank. We opened up a shop in Upper Street, Islington, um, had the full thing, dyslexic sperm bank, <laughs> all of the sort of posters, and people came in off the street. And basically, that's what people said. That was the view of dyslexia. So, I mean, what a brilliant way and creative way of, of changing the narrative. And we literally were from being nothing, a new charity, we were all over the news, on all, the around, all around the world. What was your background before setting up Made by Dyslexia? So I'd worked in advertising and media. Um, I then took a break to have my kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, I trained in dyslexia to support my son. Um, and I then spent several years researching dyslexia, specifically dyslexic thinking skills. And we had a really smart team of psychologists, educational psychologists and workplace psychologists and psychometricians um, and put together the framework of dyslexic thinking skills. So an awful lot of time and effort has gone into getting to where we've got to now. But the brilliant thing is we have all of that research, that evidence, the knowledge that I've I've 
sort of acquired over the years to actually now really push this forward. And and I think for for us, the really, really big shift was LinkedIn recognizing it as a skill um, and then producing free training on LinkedIn learning, which is phenomenal. We've got companies all over the world now that are actually training every single member of staff. We have all sorts of things that will be um, announcing later this year. So there's a real momentum happening. And and it's, it's great having digital and social media and being able to produce everything for free, I think is what is going to be the game changer. It's just hugely inspiring for us at the charity to kind of go, here's a case study that it works, that actually you can be really creative and use modern forms of media to make real impact and real change yeah 100 percent. and making it free and accessible and available just means it can travel right i think that's the thing I, I i think that you know dyslexia is a big business you know in in the states if you have a dyslexic you think your child is dyslexic then um if you're wealthy enough and you're smart enough you can actually pay for a private assessment you can then sue your school district because they're not providing the support that you need and in many instances they will then pay for your child to go to a really expensive private dyslexia school which as part of the settlement yeah which means that you know and, and all the private schools around america will hate me for saying this but if you think about what that actually means to society you have a poor kid whose parents aren't smart enough to actually use the legal system who is going to get nothing whilst somebody who is is smart enough to use the legal system will end up having eighty thousand dollars a year paid for their child to go to private school we have to make sure this is available in every school that every school is is screening for dyslexia we know that phonics is what should be happening in schools and that's happening in schools now it's st- starting to happen around the world but it's all the other bits it's about knowing the things that dyslexics will struggle with outside of just learning to read initially but those amazing strengths mm. and making sure that those strengths are given as much or more importance than the challenges and where's the uk education system at today In one way, it's ahead because we actually use phonics now across all schools. In America, they're still having a little bit of reading wars, but I think the phonics is is winning. I mean, we've known that works since the 1930s, as I said. Um, So in one way, we're ahead with that. But in another way, we're really behind. And that's the way that we are testing children with high stakes, knowledge-based Um, exams, which basically artificial intelligence can do better than us. I mean, now AI can remember every single bit of information you ever need, and it can assimilate it to give you an amazing um, base to to build on. Best memory bank in the world. Exactly. So the fact that we're actually memorizing things for exams and then handwriting them in many instances (laughs) is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but also we know that the 80% of dyslexics leave school without having their dyslexia identified. And I actually think as much as we should be doing more screening, I think if we just rely on phonics, a lot of kids, a lot more kids will be hidden because they will grasp reading and people will not think that they need to kind of look for it. So having that screening in every single school that looks at the strengths and the challenges is really important. And can that be done internally within a school rather than externally? Yeah, good schools. And there are loads of schools that are doing amazing things. They screen every single child. You need to screen every single child often. So not just at if they fail their phonics test, but the whole way through school because dyslexia can show up at different ages. You need to make sure you've got good phonics in school. But the most important thing we need to do is that every single teacher needs to be trained in how to support dyslexia and dyslexic thinking in the classroom because every single teacher is a teacher of dyslexic children. It is one in five kids, 20% of kids are dyslexic alone and we know that from longitudinal studies but because it's not being screened and picked up you've got this massive percentage leaving school without being identified so what as a charity we've created that free teacher training that every single teacher can can take it takes a day to go through all of our training courses and new york city put all 100,000 teachers through it um, we've got other cities other countries all sorts of people everywhere picking up on it but it's making it free that is really important it's free it's on demand it's online um and that we just need to make sure that 
every teacher is it knows how to spot these kids and and see their brilliance and what happens simplistically with those 80 percent that go through the education system versus the 20 percent that are diagnosed and therefore likely far more supported what happens as they grow up what what have you seen i think it depends how dyslexic you are, how much you struggle at school. My elder son is very, very dyslexic. Um, In fact, when he was assessed, the psychologist said that he is one of the most dyslexic children that she'd ever assessed. And what does that mean, if you can say, in terms of being very, very dyslexic? So Ted um, struggled hugely with reading, um, really struggled with sequential memory and, and anything that related to schoolwork. But he got the right support early. He's an avid reader. He passed all his exams except for his maths. Um, And uh, he's gone on to do something he loves. He's a music producer and an artist, and he's really successful at what he does. Um, What Because he had support from age five, and that's where my campaigning started, because I just thought, I have this brilliant little boy who's super creative, doesn't like schoolwork Mm. at all. He's dyslexic, and I need to kind of get in and and fight for him, really, because his confidence was really, really badly affected. He got bullied. He had a terrible time at school, and it's because he felt stupid, and he wasn't stupid. He was super smart. So I think even a very dyslexic child can learn to read, can learn to succeed in an academic setting of sorts. Um, then nowadays, there's a lot more emphasis on punctuation, spelling and grammar and um, rote learning and exams. So it was a bit easier when Ted was at school. And how important do you think those things are? I do think it's really important that kids learn to read and write. It's really important that we learn the basics. Yeah. But it's also really important to recognise that technology is going to be able to help support all of those things. So actually grading a child's work based on how good their spelling is, is ridiculous. You should be grading a child's work based on how good their ideas are, Mm -hmm. because otherwise you're just going to miss out on this massive percentage of really brilliant kids and and tell them they're stupid just because they can't spell. And that's that's really bad news because that happens very early in school and it affects your confidence really early. But that, because that's how you're judged at school, right? Well, that's how we measure intelligence. By your peers, your friends, mm. teachers, grades, what schools you can go to, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, it, uh, what universities you can go to, yeah. what jobs you can get. It, it it feels very foundational in terms of a child's esteem and worth that's been very binary, Yeah, I guess, historically. And I think also at school, I mean, if you think that there's research that says that for every every negative thought or every negative comment, you need five positive comments. A dyslexic child at school, I can remember my own childhood. By the time I was five years old, I was absolutely bombarded by negative comments by teachers because I couldn't spell or I couldn't read or, you know, I might jumble my words up a little bit or... Um, be disorganized and late or all of those things. It's all negative, negative, negative. Um, instead of thinking, you know, what a what a really nice little girl, how good I was with people, how, you know, I had a, a real rapport with all of my classmates and mm. I had a great imagination, all of those things. Nothing, none of those were spotted at school till I went to my second school. And then they picked up on all of those things. So, Kate, what do you think is the best support that we can give you know, children at school, it, you know, things like extra time. Um, I think there's these sort of reading, learning support pens that magnify the words. What do you think the best support is? I think you should get whatever you need. Um, I mean, extra time for me is an absolute lifesaver and was okay. in exams. Um, and it was for my younger son, who is dyslexic, but not as severely dyslexic as Ted. Extra time for Ted probably didn't make a huge amount of difference because he kind of was going to struggle anyway. This technology now is phenomenal. I mean, I do find it hard to believe we still handwrite exams in in this country, but hopefully that will change um, because it has to change. Is there a country that you think really is leading the way in this space? Not really. Okay. In all honesty. No one's um, like actually ahead of the game. There's there's a... Every country's got its sort of strengths and its challenges. Um, 
I think there are some really interesting things developing, which I can't talk about at the moment, but really amazing things happening in, in countries you wouldn't expect to happen. And I think this year is going to be quite an informative year for, for dyslexia um, from all of the work and stuff that we've got coming up. But no, I don't think anybody's getting it right, which is is quite good, really, because then we can... I mean, New York are doing incredible things. They're not perfect. There's a lot more they need to do. But actually training 100,000 teachers mm. in two days using our training was pretty damn amazing. Yeah. Um, and then we're working with them to to put in the new courses as well that we've done. So that that's a, a real juggernaut that they've had to kind of turn around. And I think Mayor Adams is, he's dyslexic, he's he's visionary, he's really trying to make a difference. I guess we're seeing, or I, I believe, and, and I couldn't believe how many of my heroes or heroic, important contributions to the world had come from, you know, people whose brains were wired a bit differently. And so having a mayor of a city who's genuinely personally invested in that and incredibly passionate about it surely is part of why those kind of numbers and that kind of program can happen. Yeah, it's about getting stuff done. I mean, what what Mayor Adams did, and we, you know, we've known, we tend not to talk about the negative, negative side of dyslexia, but the truth is we do know that a huge percentage of people in prison are people who weren't uh, dyslexic people, who weren't picked up, can't read and write. And what do you do? I mean, nowadays we have technology, it might be slightly different, but really what can you do if you can't read and write, you can't get a job? Yep. Um, so we know that there's that link. And Mayor Adams really saw that link and he saw the problem. He wanted to go upstream and stop the problem before it starts. And and that he just looked and said, that's it. Because the irony is when people are supported and I guess set on the right path and informed, we're going to talk about entrepreneurship in a minute, but you, you can see history tells us this shelf tells us that when channeled in the right way, oh my God, like incredible things can happen. But it takes, I guess, people like the mayor to go, well, I need to go and find where I need to intervene to get people the help that they need so that lots of people don't end up in my prison system that don't need to. Yeah, and I think he also looked at, because he's dyslexic, he um, he prides himself um, or his he, he says that his dyslexia is why he's successful because he's able to simplify things. He's been able to go upstream, see why why is there a problem? What do I do to solve the problem? But he really, really recognises dyslexic thinking skills and the strengths. So he recognises the importance of actually pulling on that too. And I think that's the important thing, isn't... I think if we get completely lost in the fact that the main reason that people are failing to learn to read at school, read and write, is dyslexia. We know that. The research I did back in 2007 found that. The answer is training teachers so they know how to teach reading properly and they spot all kids and give them the help. I think what's new now and, what's, and what we have now is all of this really rich evidence around dyslexic thinking skills. And all of those incredible people that you've mentioned – They've used dyslexic thinking to create what they've created, whether it's the Wright brothers using their their imagination and their real innovative future thinking to see how do we fly, what can we do, or you know whether it's Edison with a light bulb, all of those people have used dyslexic thinking to get to where they've got to. And imagine if we can unleash that on the world. Imagine if we can tell every dyslexic person that they have the ability to be brilliant. Whatever your brilliance is, everybody has the ability to be brilliant. Imagine if we can just untap that and that's what we want to do. Yeah. And you look at the the state of the world, I guess, with its various crises that are all going on all at the same time. I do and I'm obviously biased, but I do think that whether it was Einstein that said it, if we keep doing the same thing, we'll get the same results. And that is the definition of insanity. Completely. And therefore, different thinking. Yeah, it's the answer to everything. I mean, we've just got to realise that the way that we've done things for so many years doesn't work anymore. And there are these brilliant minds that think differently. And that's what we need to tap into. It's an exciting time for neurodiversity. I think. Yeah. And I I heard you say on a podcast that you really believe that the time is now. Yeah. I 100% believe that we've reached that tipping point. And I think we're going to see now 
and over the next five years, we're going to see dramatic shift. And and it, it is happening. It's really, we in the seven years that we've been doing what we're doing, I can really sense that shift happening. And I hope that the, you know, we dyslexia is the oldest neurodiversity. And uh, I think it is it is the most common. And I think if it can be the catalyst for change for everything else, then that's just an amazing thing to be. So I can really sense that that change. And just having those free resources, creating creating the sense. I mean, I, I'm absolutely blown away every day by the messages I receive um, from LinkedIn or social media or wherever with people who are talking about their dyslexia for the first time ever and um, are just really empowered by, by the fact we're totally focusing on strengths. Um, and that just, there's just huge percentage of the population that are waking up to the fact, you know, actually, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to champion it. I'm going to take this training into my workplace or my school. And I'm, I know, I mean, I wish when I had hit the brick wall with my son, Ted, if I'd had made by dyslexia to go in and say, look at this, my journey would have been a lot less painful, but then I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. But so. you wouldn't have set it up. <laughs> no. I'm really interested in the connection between neurodivergence, dyslexia, specifically in entrepreneurship, Kate. So can you just, yeah, could you just share a bit on that, that connection? If you look at dyslexic thinking, the fact that we're brilliant at seeing the big picture, we're brilliant at spotting patterns, we're brilliant at um, emotional intelligence and connecting and storytelling, communication. So if you put all of those things together, it makes the perfect entrepreneur. I think also we are experts at failing. We fail from a very young age, so it's something that is really in our wheelhouse. And I think you have to, as an entrepreneur, you've got to be prepared to fail. You've got to take risks. So I think all of those things together are why we know that 40% of entrepreneurs are dyslexic. Um, so if you look at any of the great, if you look at Richard Branson, who we work very closely with, you know, Richard's model at Virgin is to go into an industry and see what he can do to disrupt it, to make it better for people. Um, most entrepreneurs aren't led by money. That's not what drives them. Um, it actually is about making a difference, making something better. Well, you'll know with everything that you've done. So, um, and I think that applies to social entrepreneurship as well. I mean, there are so many incredible people doing incredible things that are using their dyslexic thinking to make the difference. And and I think that the whole of Made by Dyslexia and the reason that we've got to where we've got to so quickly is because it's dyslexic thinking. You know, I'm dyslexic, my whole team almost are dyslexic. So it's really being able to see the big picture, that sort of helicopter top-down view of seeing a landscape, using a really multi-sensory view of how people feel, how it makes you feel, what you want people to feel, all of those incredible insights to to create a brand or a charity or whatever it is that you're passionate about. We have our charity prism and we're a neurodivergent team and I find that super powerful and really amazing and special. What are some of the challenges and I guess, you know, the benefits of working with a dyslexic team at your charity? Well, every every successful team um is led by strengths first. And as a dyslexic person, um, we all have different strengths and challenges. So it's about leaning into your strengths. I mean, my my superpowers will be somebody else's kryptonite. So it's just knowing what those are and making sure that you have a balanced team. So, And, and we have got people on the team who are not dyslexic, only one or two, just because we we need to be, as a charity, everything that we do needs to be very much dyslexic thinking. We need to be bold. We need to be creative. We need to be um, you know, very determined to get to where we want to get to and, and take risks. But we also need to have the structure of making sure that you do run a very together charity and have everything together that has to be there. It's really empowering and just amazing to hear that it's possible to run a successful charity filled with lots of amazing different thinkers. Could you, for the benefit of listeners and watchers, let's just touch on some of the amazing icons, idols, inventions. Could you just 
reel off some of the amazing people and contributions that have been made by dyslexia. So we have the ones that everybody knows about. So you've got Richard Branson with Virgin, you've got the founder of IKEA, and that's a wonderful story of how he he used his dyslexic thinking to come up with that whole concept. You've got the Wright brothers who invented the plane. You've got probably one of my most favorite dyslexics is Muhammad Ali. Um, I think Muhammad Ali, his, his courage, his conviction, his belief in what he wanted to change in the world is phenomenal. He was an amazing storyteller. He was a brilliant sports person. Um, and we're working very closely with the Muhammad Ali Center and actually training all of the teachers in Kentucky. And in my the next series of the podcast, Lessons in Dyslexic Thinking, I've interviewed his uh, widow, Lonnie Ali, and it is the most moving interview. But wherever you look throughout history, if you look at um, storytellers, for instance, you have Roald Dahl, you have Agatha Christie, you have Liz Pichon, who we've also just um, interviewed and Dav Pikey. You've just got incredible people because dyslexics are really good with words. We're just not always good at spelling them um, and maybe need some help to get them down on paper. Um, but yeah, it's just, just wherever you look in life, there's an amazing, amazing multitude of fantastic dyslexic people. The guy who discovered the Titanic, I mean, that's a Bob Ballard, that's another wonderful story, how he just. He just sensed that it was there and all of his team were saying to him, no, no, it can't be there. We can't see it. And he said, no, I just know it's there. So it, how long had they been looking for it? Yeah. Years and years and yeah. years. And he just, no, it's there. And they went down and they found it. And, you know, paleontologists, just incredible people. It's, it's just that wonderful, different way of thinking that solves problems or creates businesses or probably didn't too well, do too well in exams. Yeah, and who cares about exams, right? And I think Richard Branson's been, you know, he's been he's been very vocal, hasn't he? He's done mm. a lot of work for a long time. Um, but I would expect that not a lot of people know that Muhammad Ali was dyslexic. Yeah, he didn't really talk about it very much. In fact, his wife Lonnie's dyslexic as well, um, and she completely turned his his business around. Um, which she talks about on the podcast. But no, I think people, there are a lot of people out there that we don't really know about who are just starting to talk about it. And loads of amazing regular people that will never be famous that are doing incredible things. Um, So it's just about finding all these fantastic minds and celebrating them. Yeah, and letting them flourish. So I, I did hear you say that you're effectively aiming to kind of close the charity in 2030. That's our goal. Our mission is to not exist. Your mission is to not exist, which I love. We're six years away from that. How will you know that you can close beyond it being a deadline? Well, our mission is to empower every dyslexic thinker in every home, every workplace, every school. Um, a lot of a lot of the solution with dyslexia is a shift in how we see it. Um, I think dyslexia is the only neurodiversity that isn't classed as a medical issue. It is an education issue. Is it a learning disability? It's a learning difference. It's Dyslexia is a different way of processing information. Um, we're not very good at the traditional way that we measure. Um, at, at we measure intelligence. Um, we don't think in a sequential way, which is the way that exams and the way we learn. We have a big picture um, way of thinking. We see, we have to see the whole view of something. But just a, a practical thing you can do in a classroom to support a dyslexic learner, which just shows how simple just that mindset is, is if at the beginning of every lesson, you say to to all of your students, right, this is what we're going to learn in this lesson. So you give them the big picture. These are the things we want you to take out of the lesson. So you're setting up what you're expecting from a dyslexic, from everybody. For a dyslexic kid, that's so empowering because then you can sit in the lesson knowing what the big picture is, what you're wanting to get out of somebody, and then you can you can really contribute. Whereas otherwise, you're just sitting there thinking, what's coming next? Where Where's am I going? going? Yeah, and it gives relevance to everything. So just so much of supporting dyslexia is about mindset. It's about understanding the different way of thinking that's actually a good way of thinking. I, and I, I think a, a lot of that, and just from an autistic perspective, the why and the parameters and the context and the outcomes and the process and the flow 
yeah, I need those things and I want those things. The irony is I think there's some amazing principles from having to do it the hard way of how best you can support dyslexia, autism, et cetera, that actually should be more common regardless of how your brain works. A hundred percent. I mean, there is there is no one way of thinking. There are lots of different ways of thinking. So why do we think as a world that one way of thinking is the important one that we measure? We should be allowing everybody to pull on those strengths that they've got. We should be allowing everybody to ask for what they need if they don't think in the way that you're delivering information. So it's it's really simple. Is A lot of it is about this shift of perception, whether you're dyslexic, autistic, or ADHD, or whatever. It's about saying, this is who I am. This is how I think. This is what I need to best perform. So help me to do that because it's in everybody's interest for you for everybody to be the best that they can be for everybody to everybody discover wins. their brilliance exactly so it's kind of it is just that shift of you know there's not one right way there are lots of different ways and we need to be more accepting of that across the board Kate you say it kind of it's so simple it is simple it's it really, really simple. is simple the first thing we have to do is change our perception because it really is that simple. And for a dyslexic person to understand that the way that they think is brilliant and that spelling doesn't really matter, that I mean, I can remember sitting in lessons at school, having amazing, amazing words coming into my head and thinking, I can write this story and I can use this word. And then I'd start to spell it. And I'd say, I can't do that. I have to put something really simple in there. That's crazy. People would have understood if I'd written it down, but it's having that confidence. It's the same with ideas and big picture thinking and finding solutions before anybody else can. Having the confidence to say, actually, I think this is the answer to something without actually being able to go through your sequential process is really important. But it's just judged it's right or wrong, exactly. right? Rather than the content. You yeah, or, or with maths. I mean, I, I am. I took me five times to get my maths O level as it was back in the day. I don't know my times tables. I can't do anything sequentially. I'm a big picture person. Um, but I can. I at school I would know the answers to a math problem because I'd have kind of logically found my way to the answer. But it would always be wrong because I couldn't show my workings, and, yeah. and that's ridiculous. We do a lot of work with GCHQ, um, and they actively recruit people who are dis and other neurodiversities as well because they recognize they need to have people who think differently. And um, in their 24-7 um, uh, area, which is where they've, they've got spies who are like looking across lots of information, um, they pride themselves on having people in there that can spot patterns, that can see things before others can't. They're not asked to, well, so what was your sequential, sequential way of actually getting to that? You know, they've yeah. recognized a terror threat or recognized a cyber threat. And those things, if people can find an answer quickly, we just need to know they find an answer quickly and act on it. All the best, most famous spies and detectives did it differently. Yeah. Didn't you want they? to get there quicker. Yeah. You don't have to go through the linear process. You want to get there quicker. Yeah. Just a couple of like simple bits of clarity for people. Can you develop dyslexia? Dyslexia is hereditary. It is the way that your brain works. It's the way that your brain is is wired and the way you process information. So um, it's with you for life. It's just the way you think. It's not something you can recover from. You can learn how to read. You can learn how to do some of the things we're expected to do at school, learn how to learn in the way that we want to teach. But we'll always be dyslexic, and it's that brilliance. I mean, I love being dyslexic. I love the way I think. I wouldn't change it for the world. But I do recognize it's painful at school or it's painful in the workplace if you kind of can't, you just have that sort of mismatch and you can't do things that you're expected to do. And is it about mental health? Dyslexia isn't about mental health because it is a learning difference. But you can, if you struggle and you don't get the help, it can lead to mental health problems without a shadow of doubt. I mean, there's some horrible statistics around suicide and all of those alcohol, um, all of Anxiety, those things. Anxiety, depression. Yeah, totally, totally, yeah. totally. Um, and I think that's why it's 
it's really important to recognize the strengths because as a dyslexic person from a very young age you've had a lot of criticism placed on you at school and you've it's really important we get over that and really try and find a way of celebrating everything we're good at and laughing at the challenges my spelling makes me laugh a lot of the time and other people <laughs> in fact i have a, a line at the end of my email saying expect creative spelling and creative thinking <laughs> just just making you aware yeah two more things I know that a lot of children are going to watch this episode and I know some of those children and you know it makes my palms kind of sweaty because I'm I'm so excited for them to to hear you and and see you speak and I know some of them are struggling and you know there's kids that are yeah that are not happy and were born with all their self-esteem and self-worth and they're not, they're not feeling that now. And so, I don't know why I'm getting don't, emotional make about me cry. that. But, but it's, it is, it's tough. It's hard. It's horrible. Yeah, I. I it's kinda, really horrible. You have bri- these brilliant little souls. Now you're going to make me cry. These yeah. brilliant little souls that go into school thinking that they're they're good at this because you know you. And I've got a wonderful picture of my son. Um, which I put in my TED talk actually of him with his superhero. Robin. He thought he thought he could do anything, you know, like most kids do. And you know, he was he was super creative, loved his music, had all the things he loved. And then he started school, and it's just you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, as a child, you feel horrible and you feel stupid when other people can do the things that you can't do. And it's really, really, really important for those kids for parents and for teachers to know that the children that are going to be struggling to learn in the traditional way are the brilliant thinkers that don't fit into that mold. And you have to help them to learn, but you need to see where their brilliance is. You need to find that spark. You need to find their dyslexic thinking or their neurodiversity. Find those strengths and and pull on those. Do not criticize them. Do not tell them they're stupid. And for every dyslexic child, every child who's sitting in a classroom that is where I get really upset <laughs> and, and feels that they don't fit in. You do. You're just different and that's beautiful and it's brilliant and find your strengths. Yeah, thank you. We have a tradition uh, per se of adding something to our, I still got to find a better word for it, neuro spicy cabinet of contributions. Display of brilliant minds. Display of brilliant minds. That's a much better one. Thanks, Kate. Uh, <laughs> that obviously if you're listening, you you... You can't see, but if you're watching, you can. And we've got some amazing dyslexics uh, featured on here from Apple to Einstein to Ali, Roald Dahl, the Wright brothers, a lot of people that we've been talking about today. Have you brought something to add to the shelf? So I have two books. The most important one after what we've been talking about today is this one, which is um, for kids. And we've looked at the different, we've researched the different um, dyslexic thinking archetypes in kids. It is brilliant for every teacher to read, um, every dyslexic child to read and every parent to read because it's all about positivity. And then my adult book, which is called This is Dyslexia. Um, This is dyslexia. It's not negative. It's not a bad thing. It's a different way of learning. We need to help within school system, but we need to really focus on strengths because The way that we think is directly aligned with the World Economic Forum skills for the future. And it's really important that we make sure that we empower every dyslexic person. Yeah, I think it's a necessity given the state of the world. Yeah, I I really think it's it's vital. Uh, Thank you. Can you put them, find somewhere for them to go on on the shelves? Who do they want to go and sit with? Yeah, let's put them near Charles Darwin, Temple Grandin, Greta Thunberg. Yes, and the Beatles. And the Beatles. To be next to the Beatles. Yes. John Lennon, Paul McCartney. Exactly. Dyslexic. Legends. Uh, thanks so much, Kate. Thank you. And please, I know you will, it doesn't matter whether I ask you to or not, but please just keep doing what you're doing because you're not only a beacon for dyslexics, but you're a massive beacon for us and our charity so thank you amazing thank you and and congratulations on all you're doing it's it's an amazing time to be neurodiverse 